Years ago, I watched as my son was born into this world. That was one of the most awe-inspiring and transforming events in my entire life, and I will never stop thinking about it. I can't begin to describe my sense of amazement, fear, and joy as my son slowly and then loudly made his presence known. I looked at my wife throughout that long winter night with the same sense of amazement, fear, and joy. Mothers are amazing people, and I will never think of them the same way again, having witnessed the wonder and absolute magic of birth. My son struggled to be born, and the struggle tired my wife. At the time, I worried about the two of them, mother and child. During the most difficult stage of the birth, as my son struggled inside the birth canal, his heartbeat slowed, and then it seemed to stop for a precious few seconds. The doctor explained that this was common in such a situation as this. He had a monitor set up to echo John's heartbeat throughout the hospital room. My mother-in-law and I stood beside Diane's hospital bed watching and listening to the sounds of the struggle. As John's heartbeat slowed, we would grimace and anxiously await his return to normalcy. We were both greatly relieved every time it did. At one point during the delivery, John's heart stopped beating entirely and my mother-in-law and I both saw one of the nurses quickly look at the doctor with what seemed to us to be a look of alarm in her eyes. My heart almost stopped. I began silently counting the seconds, trusting that John's heartbeat would return within a few of my counts. But his heartbeat didn't return. As my alarm grew, it seemed as if no one else in the room realized the severity of the situation except for Diane's mom. The doctor and the nurses went about their routine of bringing life into the world, unaware of my growing sense of doom. The counting of the seconds continued, and after about 30 of them, I began to mourn the loss of my son. At the count of 45, one of the nurses recognized the look of fright in my mother-in-law's eyes and quickly informed us that there was no problem. She told us that the little monitor attached by suction to the top of John's head had come off. His heart was beating just fine, even if we couldn't hear it. The weight of eternity quickly dissipated from the room, and I quietly kissed the face of God. Within a few minutes, my son was born, joyous to be alive. A few years after my son was born, I received a report from a North Coast tribal member that a human bone had been observed eroding from the base of a sea cliff near a prehistoric shell midden. I knew this site. Its remote and isolated setting suggested to me that it was situated on an ideological plane midway between the constructs of community and wilderness. As such, it would have been a place of great excitement, power, and potential. The site represented the seasonal campsite to which people had come to catch fish, collect seaweed, and gather shellfish for countless generations. As a result of this long human history, the site's soil is stained dark with the charcoal of past campfires, and there are countless fire-affected rocks that speak volumes about past warming fires and cooking fires, too. Perhaps most dramatic, though, are the layers upon layers of shells interlaced with the charcoal and the rocks attesting to the sea's bountiful harvest. The morning after I received a report, I drove to the coast and met with the two tribal members who had spotted the bone. Also present was a representative of the county coroner's office. Together we walked along the windswept beach to the site. Upon reaching the area, we found several articulated human bones protruding from the face of the cliff. It was my responsibility to recover the remains once it could be decided that they posed no concerns for the county coroner. Naturally, there is always the possibility that randomly discovered human remains will prove to be a contemporary crime scene. But that wasn't the case this time. Given the context of the remains, it was clear that this was not a recent crime scene, or in any other way a suspicious find. And in fact, I had recovered the lower extremities of a Native American burial in this exact same location just a year earlier, after first inspecting and clearing the find with the coroner's office.
At the time, the tribal elders I worked with had requested that I only recover those bones that were visible in an immediate danger of washing out of the cliff face. Over the course of winter, additional remains had become exposed due to ongoing coastal erosion. Thus, the remains of the same burial had once again become a matter of urgency and required immediate archaeological recovery. Recovering human remains was always an aspect of my job that I seldom discussed. It was often a confidential matter for the state and typically a private matter for me as well. Over the years, I have told very few people about this part of my job, although in recent years I've begun to document a few of the previous discoveries that are of special archaeological note, including the two I call the Mendocino Man and the Fort Ross Man. Every recovery effort is different, and they are sometimes quite challenging both physically and emotionally. Over the course of my career, I've handled the remains of a considerable number of men and women, including adults and children, and people of various cultures and ethnicities from the prehistoric and historic past. I've always reminded myself that the bones that I held in my hands represented real people who once breathed, dreamed, laughed, cried, and loved just as surely as I do now. Sometimes I've seen the telling evidence of traumatic death born from violence or accident, and sometimes there are signs of great suffering from crippling conditions such as arthritis and dental decay. Other times the dead look as if they expired in their sleep, perfectly at peace with the world. Occasionally I will find shell or glass beads, various kinds of tools such as projectile points and stone mortars and pestles, and even the remains of food offerings within the graves. These are the necessary things that loved ones place in the grave to accompany their loved ones to the world of the dead. Recovery of the dead can be very sobering work indeed. After my excavation tools and I had received a traditional blessing from the elders, I began to expose the bones that were protruding from the cliff face. Soon it became apparent that the right femur, right patella, the pelvis including the left and right innominates, sacrum and cossacks, the bones of the lower right hand, especially the metacarpals, and the lower part of the vertebral column, L2 to L5, of an adult were present and in immediate danger of being lost to coastal erosion, or perhaps unauthorized collection by visitors. I set about exposing these skeletal elements in a careful and dignified manner, all the while aware that I was working in an exposed, inconceivably dangerous setting. The area of the cliff directly above me had become destabilized some years earlier, and it now posed a somewhat significant landslide threat to me. I didn't want to get buried on this beach. As I exposed the left anominate, or hip bone, I discovered that there was a thin, cup-like bone directly associated with it on the ventral side. The first thought that raced through my mind was that this was a broken ostrich shell. It looked like that. That thought only lasted an instant. And then I realized that the smaller bone was part of a skull, a really small skull. It was clearly too small to belong to an adult, nor was it in the correct anatomical order to be associated with the anominate. It was already clear to me that the anominate had likely belonged to a female. The more I looked at the smaller bone, the more certain that I was it represented part of a human skull. Given the size of the bone, it seemed obvious that it had belonged to a small child. Furthermore, the bone's position among the remains of the adult indicated that it almost certainly represented a fetus. As I carefully exposed and then removed the thin cup-like bone, I saw that it was the parietal, part of the cranium. Because this was the parietal of an unborn child, there were no sutures to connect it to the rest of the cranium. However, the rest of the baby's skull was present. Soon I could see the frontal and occipital bones as well also positioned in the middle of the woman's pelvis. While I was removing the occipital bone, the cliff face in the immediate area that I was working caved in. I thrust my hand out in an attempt to catch the occipital but missed it. Instead, about a dozen small ribs landed in my open hand. Some of these bones bounced off my palm and fell to the ground below, but others remained in my hand, captured for the time being. Prior to the cave-in, I had not yet seen any of the ribs. They were apparently clustered, still in situ, just inches from the baby's small skull, and well hidden from view, just inside the sandy face of the cliff. After I had composed myself, 
I realized that I was not in danger of being buried alive by a larger landslide. I looked at my open hand. In it, I held all these little slivers of precious humanity. I must admit that as I peered at the tiny ribs, I experienced one of the most dramatic emotional experiences of my life. While I had held human remains in my hands many times prior to this, never before had I held the magnitude of such humanity as this seemed to be. As I looked back again at the frontal bone, which was still clearly visible in situ beside the anominate, I realized that the fetus's skull was in a revealing position. Indeed, the position of the bones revealed the strong possibility that just prior to the baby's death, it had dropped down and entered into the birth canal, thus beginning the long night's journey toward the light. Something had obviously happened. Something had gone terribly wrong. Perhaps the most sobering lesson of life is that death is inevitable. Indeed, death is the common denominator that links all forms of life to one another. It's the human experience to anticipate death, to plan for it, to both celebrate and dread it, and, if we're fortunate, to be prepared to go when it's our time to go. But when death comes to silence a young and otherwise promising life, the loss felt by a community is often extreme and chaotic. It's probably always been that way, even since the time of the first people. According to certain aspects of the local ethnographic records, the first people were created by Old Man Coyote. Coyote was a notorious trickster, and he was always getting into trouble because of his troublesome ways. On one occasion, Coyote foolishly created the institution of death, and then had to stand by and accept the consequences when his own daughter died. It's said that old man Coyote mourned and wailed for his beloved daughter, but eventually accepted her death as a human fate. As I worked to retrieve the remaining bones of mother and child, I imagined the great sadness that must have befallen this ancient camp as grief-stricken relatives mourned the loss of a young woman and the child that never saw the sun. Indeed, there were some unusual aspects to the woman's grave. It was clearly unlike any local grave that I'd ever seen before. When the recovery was completed, I helped the elders bury the remains of mother and child in the same safe place where we had reburied part of this woman's skeleton the year before. From this place, she and her child could look out across the sea and be serenaded for eternity by the steady drumming of the surf. Because I halted the recovery effort at L2, the woman's skull and upper torso down to L1 still rest in her original grave pit, just inside the face of the crumbling cliff. If grave offerings accompanied the woman to the land of the dead, they remained there, within what remained of the original grave pit. With some difficulty, I could have recovered the remainder of the woman's skeleton, but the elders felt that it was better to leave any of her remains alone that were not immediately threatened. So that's what we did. As we were leaving the site, one of the elders spoke of how this woman of the past had called on us for help. I thought that true and felt certain that she would call on us again someday as the rest of her remains became exposed and vulnerable to loss or theft. I knew that when that day came, we would place the rest of her in the new grave beside the remains of her unborn child. A year later, that's just what we did. At the end of the day, after recovering the mother and child's remains and helping the travel members rebury them, I went to pick my son up from his preschool. My hand still bore the dark stains of the burial site. When I arrived, I spotted John out in the playground with five or six other children his own age. Typically, when my son saw me at the end of the day at preschool, he'd run to me with a heartwarming smile on his little face. But on this day, he was so enthused in his play that he didn't notice me. In no particular hurry, I sat down and watched as he played for the longest time. John and his friends darted back and forth across the yard like little fish in a tight swimming school, or perhaps like birds in their hypnotic wing flight. The kids were all laughing and giggling with joy, and their joyous antics brought a warm smile to my hardened face. I think just maybe, for the first time in my life, I understood what life really means. It's a revelation that we all arrive at sooner or later. I think that life is embracing joy and seeing children's laughter for what it really is. Pure, 
innocent joy. Life is the kiss of the warm sun after a long winter's night. Life is not reliving the past or awaiting the future. It's just being here now. Life is all those simple little things that most of us take for granted. I realize that that's not a very scientific evaluation of life, but it's certainly a genuine and heartfelt one. When John finally noticed me, he came running. I knelt down and opened my arms, and he collided into my chest as he loved to do. Upon our impact, I gave him the biggest hug of a sweet young life. We giggled together. Then I went home and hugged my wife just as wholeheartedly. In the end, I think that joy is the only thing worth having in this life of ours. Indeed, it seems to be the meaning of life. Perhaps someday joy will replace death as the common denominator linking all of us to one another. If he were here today, I believe the old man Coyote would say, Go forth and be joyous.